Hello, everyone, and welcome to the British Library. I'm Liz Jolly, I'm Chief Librarian here, and I'm delighted to welcome both the, those of you here at St Pancras and those of you joining us online this evening. We're very glad to be able to welcome the world thanks to the live streaming of all three Panizzi lectures, including today, and we're hugely grateful to Jonathan Hill and Sokol Books, distinguished booksellers in New York and London respectively, for their support of that live streaming. Wherever you're tuning in from, welcome. The Panizzi Lectures were founded 40 years ago by Catherine Devas, a long-time lover of both books and the British Library, and were named after Sir Anthony Panizzi, who served the British Museum for nearly 40 years and was its principal librarian from 1856 to 1866. Panizzi was a moving force in creating a key element of what 50 years ago became the British Library. He created the British Museum Library's catalogue, built its famous reading room, and turned it into the biggest library in the world. The lectures build on his achievements by using the British Library's resources to advance knowledge and understanding in any field associated with the history of the book. And they're an integral part of the library's events programme. We're always keen to draw in as wide an audience as possible, to be excited and inspired by discovering more, perhaps in unexpected ways, about the history of books. Since 1985, that brief has been addressed by a distinguished series of scholars, and it is the challenge and the privilege of the Selection Council to sustain that roster. I'm delighted to introduce, for the third time this year, Professor Henry Woodhausen, the Rector of Lincoln College, Oxford. Before Oxford, Henry spent 30 years in the English department at University College London. His academic interests lie in English literature, bibliography, paleography, and editorial theory and practice. He was one of the general editors of the Arden Shakespeare Third Series, and with Michael F. Suarez, SJ, co-general editor of the Oxford Companion to the Book. His most recent publication is an edition for the collected works of Evelyn Waugh of A Handful of Dust, published by Oxford University Press in 2022. He's been president of the Bibliographical Society and the Oxford Bibliographical Society. And in 2014, he gave the Lyle Lectures at Oxford. His topic for the lectures is the fascinating figure of Thomas Hearn, diarist, antiquary, librarian and non-juror, a familiar name to anyone who's worked on Oxford book culture around the turn of the 18th century, but who has not been seriously studied for some time. It's been a delight to watch and hear Henry putting that right during his two previous lectures, and we have every expectation of an entertaining as well as an erudite third and last Panizzi lecture, where he's going to talk to us about Hearn's publication in his talk, The Studier and Preserver of Monkish Trumpery. So I'm going to give the stage to Henry. Thank you. Oh, good evening. <laughs> I didn't realise you were all here. In this third and final lecture, I want to look at Thomas Hearn as a producer of books, a printer and publisher who sought not just to provide editions of medieval and Renaissance works, but to make handsome, well-illustrated books that presented important texts in new and convenient forms. Hearn had a practical understanding of the making of books, informed by his understanding of their history as objects. There is much to be said about his choice of titles and his editorial methods, so effectively mocked by Alexander Pope. But there is perhaps also something else to be said about Hearn, who, like Pope, was interested in the relationship between form and contents in books. 
He sought to publish elegant octavo editions of historical importance for a limited number of subscribers. Despite all his difficulties with the university in Oxford, its press served as his printer. The look of publications mattered to her. The best books, he thought, were printed in a good letter and paper. He wanted exactness and accuracy as well as beauty. The letter, character or type should be handsome, beautiful, neat, even noble. The paper, very good, large, fine and white. When he was planning in 1718 a book about Charles I, a successor to his Camden, he wanted it beautifully printed upon an handsome large letter that the ladies may purchase it. The worst sort of book, such as Thomas Ruddiman's Edinburgh edition of Gavin Douglas's Virgil, was printed upon coarse paper and in an old worn letter. German books, he noted, were printed upon coarse paper and with a little letter. This was not a good idea, even if they were sold cheaply. In some ways, the most difficult decision Hearn took was to publish his books as octavos in fours, that is, each gathering made up of two half sheets. When he specified the design for his six-volume edition of Livy in March 1706, he wanted it in a handsome octavo such as we commonly use, the we being, I think, the Oxford Press. The problem for him was that the works he wished to publish could not always be accommodated in two octavo volumes. This was at its most acute with two of his earliest publications. John Leyland's Itinerary, which filled nine volumes, and his Collectanea, that added another six volumes. In the case of the itinerary, publication between 1710 and 1712 gave Hearn the opportunity to add material as he went along and not to have to start with a complete manuscript. Nevertheless, after Leyland, Hearn never went beyond two volumes, except for Forden in five in 1722 and Camden and Newber, each in three volumes in 1717 and 19. This did not stop him from adding material as he saw fit, making some of his publications rather more like academic journals with unrelated articles included in them than discrete volumes. Discussions of format with his friends began at least as early as Leyland's Collectanea. In 1711, he wrote to Richard Rawlinson, I should with all be glad to know from other people whether they had rather have one folio or two quartos or four or five octavos. This apparent flexibility soon hardened. Writing about Camden in 1716, Thomas Hinton of Corpus told Hearn, I cannot think it will be so acceptable a book to the public in octavo as it would be in folio. Arguing that he would soon find it quickly printed in Holland in folio, that volume being now more fashionable. To which Hearn replied, quoting Hinton's words back at him, the octavo is the more useful and more vendable, and I may add, the more fashionable book. Hearn never yielded, even when it was suggested that he should reprint Leyland in folio. Although he claimed that octavos were more fashionable than folios, there was an element of wishing to resist the fashion in him. I find quarto books are now so much in vogue in London, he sniffed in May 1728, which for my part I look upon as the very worst and most useless form of all. It's possible that, he, that Hearn had his eye on two recent sets of quarto volumes that had been published, Pope's six-volume edition of Shakespeare in 1723-5 to five, and his five volumes of the Odyssey in 1725-6. to six. Saying quartos were useless may perhaps have been related to his habit of reading while he walked, something not easily done with a quarto in your hands. Long before he was expelled from the Bodleian in February 1716, Hearn's own publishing career was well underway with editions of the Roman historians, notably Livy in 1708, and English ones, notably Leyland. 
It was always my opinion that Greek and Latin and English historians should be joined together, he wrote to Richard Rawlinson early in 1715. Plans for a publishing program of some kind went back to at least 1709, when the great non-juring scholar of northern languages, George Hicks, told him, I could wish you were set to publish useful manuscripts of any sorts, which would be, in my opinion, much more for the honour of the university and more useful to learning than new editions of any printed books, except such which were grown almost as scarce as manuscripts, which are but very few. The usefulness of such publications was self-evident to Hearn, whose design was of printing some of our English historians not yet published. He came up with a wonderful plan to employ six men each at Oxford and Cambridge to be engaged in nothing but publishing manuscripts. They were to be Englishmen, because they have generally stronger and clearer judgments, more sagacity, and a better invention than foreigners. A new edition of Cicero, for which proposals were published, was put on hold, and instead he would publish editions of the old English historians. It was at this time, once he had nearly finished with Leyland, that his university and Bodleian troubles began. His 1713 edition of Dodwell's dissertation on Dr. Woodward's shield was suppressed, and the curators issued a prohibition against his transcribing manuscripts. He was accused of not giving copies of the books he had printed to the Bodleian. Worse was to follow. He was effectively excluded from the library and from his two university positions as Esquire Bedell of Civil Law and his place as Archetypographus at the University Press, responsible for maintaining standards both of scholarship and of workmanship in books printed there. All this entailed a considerable loss of income and his family was not rich he had few wealthy or powerful patrons at that point. Before then, 17, the sort of 17 teens, he had begun to imagine a new life for himself. In a letter to one of his subscribers, he wrote, I shall now live very private and spend my time wholly in divine contemplation. He deleted, spend my time wholly in divine contemplation, and substituted, employ myself in publishing <laughs> old manuscripts. The gloomy mood continued. I now live like a recluse and converse much more with the dead than with the living. He described himself, asceticam quasi vitam agenti, as leading the life of an ascetic. But the publishing program resulted in four separate volumes in 1716, two sets of three volumes in 1717 and 1719, with an additional volume that year, three volumes in 1720, five in 1722, and so on. Nobody could complain that Hearn was idle and not being productive. His views hardly changed. Societies, by which he mean, meant colleges, I think, and, and the university, should engage in some great works, either never yet printed, or if printed, are become either almost or quite as rare as manuscripts. As late as March 1734, towards the very end of his life, he recalled relinquishing his plan for the edition of C Cicero, and earnestly and wholly setting about the publication of such things as belong to our national history and antiquities, and accordingly have done so much that way as is surprising to many persons. Hearn's publishing program relied on a large number of interactions with collectors, transcribers, subscribers, patrons, paper merchants, printers, booksellers, bookbinders, newspapers, and wagoners. All these had to be efficiently managed. Nobody doubts Hearn's scholarship or his attention to detail, but he is not normally associated with the sort of tact and care, the mixture of amiability and firmness that publishers need to be successful. Hearn was successful, 
A rough estimate suggests that on his usual edition size of between 160 and 200 copies, he was making 100% profit. He is said to have died, leaving up to £1,000 in cash in his rooms at St Edmund Hall. After 1716 and for the next two decades or so, publishing was his main, his only source of regular direct income. Hearn's success was built on his relations with his printers at the University Press, but John Fell's New, Year, New Year's books, initiated in 1669, may have played a part in his thinking. The different, well, difference was that while some of Fell's books were published in editions of a thousand copies as gifts and for sale, Hearn's were published by subscription and strictly limited to numbers that range between as few as 60 copies for Ross and 250 copies for Camden's Annales. His principle was that no more copies are designed to be printed than shall be subscribed for. He adhered strictly to this point of honour because he felt that extra copies or reprints, even in a new format, would lessen the value for subscribers of the books for which they had already paid. Most of the 30 or so subscription publications he issued were in editions of between 148 and 200 copies, of which as few as five of 120 copies, or as many as half, were large paper copies. For most of his later publications, almost all of the copies, over 100, were large paper ones. The difference in cost of small and large paper books ranged with him from two shillings or four shillings to a fairly constant half price. The most expensive set of books he produced was the five-volume 1722 set of Ford and Scotty Chronicon, for which he charged respectively two and three guineas for small and large uh, paper copies. Even subscribers who might be thought to have deep pockets were sometimes put off by these prices. When he published his remarkable type facsimile from the Laudian manuscript of the Acta Apostolorum, Apostolorum in 1715, Hearn did not dismiss complaints about its price, 10 shillings for a book of 41 and a half sheets. The objection about the price which my Lord Winchelsea makes is very material, but I am forced to confine myself to a very small number. I wish three or four hundred subscribers could be procured. The copies might be afforded much cheaper. He went on to suggest that the edition was in effect underpriced. Notwithstanding my loss, I am very easy and cheerful. Hearn had to keep careful accounts of the subscriptions, who had paid what and when. At the start of his publishing career, the usual arrangement was that half of the subscriber's fee was to be paid at the time of subscribing and the remainder when the copies were delivered. By 1729, with the publication of Evesham, he was sufficiently confident of his customers to ask them for the full amount at the time of subscribing, a practice he maintained to his last book. The endless misunderstandings, confusions and wranglings, especially with late payers, are all recorded in Hearn's accounts and in the collections. By far the most complicated set of subscriptions that Hearn had to manage was for the 120 copies of the nine-volume edition of Leyland's itinerary published between 1710 and 1712. There were originally 87 different subscribers to the edition, most taking just one copy or one set, others two or more, up to the 12 sets John Woodward took. As subscribers dropped out or died, their copies became available, as did those of people who had ordered multiple copies. These were reassigned some several times over. In all, Hearn had to deal with 112 individuals, with copies of particular volumes moving around among a complicated web of subscribers. When he undertook his next publication with a list of subscribers, Roper's Life of Moore in 1716, 
Of his 113 individual subscribers, 85 were new and 28 had already uh, bought the sets of Leyland. Hearn found his subscribers from among his colleagues in Oxford and Cambridge, the clergy, lawyers in and around the Inns of Court, members of the College of Arms, the medical profession, the gentry and the aristocracy, who took an interest in scholarly and antiquarian matters, and of course the book trade. A few women subscribed to his work. The old English scholar Elizabeth Elstob, for example, was a late subscriber to Leyland's itinerary with volume seven and had her set made up with the gift of the earlier volumes by the Oxford professor of Greek, Edward Thwaites, who had subscribed for six sets from the start of the publication. An unidentified Lady Cavendish was a subscriber to his edition of Roper's Life of Moore, as was the rather more fixable Anna Henrietta Oglethorpe, the supposed mistress of James III, the pretender. His subscribers came mainly from Oxford and London, as well as his home county of Berkshire and thereabouts, but he also had supporters in the north and one or two in Europe. In some ways, the best recruiters of subscribers were current ones who might take anything between two and twelve copies of a work and either give them away, as Thwaites did, or encourage others to buy them and join Hearn's regular purchasers, as Hans Sloan and several others regularly did. Of course, booksellers might buy copies on commission or to sell them. The names of Henry Clement's father and son, one in Oxford, the other in London, Stephen Fletcher in Oxford, and Christopher Bateman, William Innes, John Lewis, William Lewis in London, almost all taking multiple copies, occur in early publications. The easiest and most obvious means to advertise his books was by putting announcements of their publications in the London newspapers. Something of the success of Hearn's programme can be judged by the six advertisements that appeared in the Daily Current for the various volumes issued at different times of, the, of Leyland's itinerary. For the six volumes of the Collectinaire all issued together, it seems only one advertisement was needed in the same paper. The hiatus between Camden's Annales, published in 1718, and of William of Newburgh's Chronicle, was explained in an advertisement in November 1719. The troubles he refers to in the advertisement were, of course, with the university. For Hearn, this guarded explanation seems relatively forthcoming. As well as the postboy, there were occasional advertisements in the Daily Chronicle, and these newspaper advertisements were placed by his London friends, principally Thomas Rawlinson. A further trick could occasionally be turned. The cost of an advertisement in The Postboy was four shillings. This was the newspaper printer, George James's initial payment, for a copy of Sprott's Chronicle. He is indeed listed as a subscriber. Newspaper advertising was useful, but it was not targeted, and the insertions jostled for space with lost dogs, lottery tickets, thefts, houses for rent, and other new books and, au and auctions. Most subscription publishing was begun with a set of printed proposals, outlining the form and content of the work to be printed, often giving a specimen page or two from it and soliciting subscriptions. It seems that Hearn only used this method twice, once with a very brief perspective, prospectus for Leyland's Collectinea issued in 1712, and again with the more elaborate edition, prospectus, of Cicero in 1715. Rather than rely on the prospectus, not a word Hearn ever used, as far as I can tell, he produced his own advertising matter for his books. Drafts of this can occasionally be uh, found. And his advertising flyers, sorry, sorry, drafts of this can occasionally be found. His advertising flyers, which he used much more extensively, were printed at the university press. 21 of these flyers are known, issued between 1712 and 1735. 
They mostly survive in just two or three copies sent to Harley or Sloan and are now among their manuscripts here in the British Library. It's clear that quite a few, seven or eight, have simply not survived. The flyers are all broadly similar, printed on a folded sheet of paper in octavo format with the advertisement on the verso of the first leaf and room on the recto of the second for Hearn to write a short letter to the recipient. The leaves would then be folded with the address panel usually on the verso of the second leaf that often bore his set, one of his set of seals. Many of these flyers were specifically targeted, but friends such as Roger Gale offered, if you will send 20 such flyers to me, I don't despair of returning you a subscriber for every one of them. Gale correctly linked the flyers that Hearn sent out to the advertisements that appeared in his publications. They were more often printed at the very end of the book, but quite a few appeared at the end of the prelims, perhaps suggesting that these were set after the main text. In fact, seven of the extant flyers share some or all of the same setting of type, including the heading as those that appear in the books. The flyers tend to have a two-line drop capital for their opening that the book advertisements do not. But much of the rest of the two sets of advertisements appear identical and were set from standing type. Hearn took the subscriptions he had solicited and sold his books at the Bodleian and from St Edmund Hall. William Seal, bookbinder near the Angel Inn in Oxford, John Rance at the Theatre Printing House and after Rance's death, Joseph Brookland also took in subscriptions. His method of staying directly in touch with his subscribers caused Hearn a huge amount of work and endless letters. When things went wrong and they didn't get their books, the subscribers complained. Other errors were more embarrassing. The subscriber's main complaint was that it would be much simpler if Hearn would appoint some bookseller in town to take the in subscriptions and have some place in London where subscribers might call for their books. But Hearn did not want to go into any more partnerships with the book trade than was strictly necessary. The result was that he lent rather heavily on the goodwill of his friends. They sometimes complained. Rafe Bridges protested that he was expected to be Hearn's book conveyor, an office more properly belonging to booksellers. Hearn's justification was probably that this kept his costs down. The carriers between Oxford and London were especially important for Hearn's business. The widow Badcock served from 1710 until her death in 1717 and was succeeded by Thomas Godfrey. Both put up in London at the Oxford Arms in Warwick Lane, where Godfrey had a warehouse. He carried Hearn's publications and the money for them, his purchases and letters, as well as Thomas Rawlinson's boxes of books for him. Hearn paid Godfrey fourpence in the pound, so that a bill of six pounds cost two shillings in carriage. Hearn usually paid this himself, but some of his grandest subscribers took on the charge. By 1719, when Newbra was published, Hearn was attracting subscribers not just for individual publications, but for everything that he issued. The scholarly Yorkshire antiquary Roger Gale was one of these. Such, as, such subscribers were called perpetual or constant subscribers, of which there were at least 15. Their places were sought after. When the physician Henry Levitt died in 1725, his brother Richard wrote to Hearn asking to become a constant subscriber in his place. A few years later, in 1728, Thomas Baker, the Cambridge uh, 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 ejected fellow from St John's, told Hearn that if Mr Parn stopped subscribing, his place could be taken by Beaupre Bell, a Lincolnshire gentleman. Subscribers who died created vacancies that could then be filled. Hearn's funeral took place on Saturday the 14th of June, 1735, at St Peter's in the East, 
just next door to St Edmund Hall. His coffin was covered with black cloth and very well furnished with silver handles, plates and nails. Two heads of house, one of them, I'm glad to say, the then rector of Lincoln, and various fellows bore the pall. The coffin was carried by, among others, Brookland, his printer, Godfrey, his carrier, and Hanley, his bookbinder. The presence of the academics is hardly surprising, but the prominent roles for members of the trade indicate how central they were to Hearn's life. Before printing could begin, Hearn had to edit the texts that he wanted to publish, and before he could edit them, he had to have access to the manuscripts he was going to reproduce. For this, because he couldn't use the Bodleian and he wouldn't go to London, he relied on a group of transcribers in libraries that he could not or would not visit himself. The earliest among these was Williams, the sub-librarian at the Ashmolean and assistant to Edward Lloyd, who charged 12 pence a sheet for copying. Hearn found his transcripts unsatisfactory. Andrew Rinman, a Swede, was, Hearn recorded, a very good scholar and well-versed in manuscripts, but he was poor, and therefore he was employed to transcribe and collate for others, who then published his work as theirs. When Rinman left Oxford, Hearn wrote, there has been no competent amanuensis in Oxford since the enforced departure of Mr Rinman. Hearn himself copied for William Fleetwood, Bishop of St Asaph, and arranged for copying to be done under his supervision in the Ashmolean at the rate of two and six a sheet, on top of the rather outrageous charges of six shillings for admission and threepence a day to work there. The real difficulty, Hilkiah Bedford was told by Hearn, was finding young scholars who were capable of reading, studying, and transcribing old manuscripts. I do not know one of them at present that applies himself that way. William Slifford, an expeditious scribe and good at drawing, worked successively in this way for Peter Lenave and other scholars. After 1716, the problem was largely solved by employing David Casley, who was deputy librarian to the Royal Library and the Cotton Collection, with easy access to the Harley Library. He transcribed material for various scholars, collating manuscripts Hearn used in nine of his editions, published between 1722 and 1732. He was expensive. Casley charged one and sixpence for transcribing a sheet in the Cotton Library, so that the total cost of copying the text of Otterbourne was as much as five pounds, 17 shillings and tuppence. Before printing began, paper would be bought, initially from someone called Butterfield, a wholesale stationer in Bread Street, London, on the recommendation of Thomas Allen that he would furnish you with very good printing paper at an easy rate. That was in 1711, when Hearn was at work on Leyland's itinerary. Five years later, at, in the busy year of 1716, he wrote to Butterfield ordering 10 reams of royal at 55 shillings, adding, let the paper be worth the money. It will be an encouragement to deal with you again, which I am willing to do. Hearn kept an, idea, an eye on Wolvercut Mill and those associated with it. Through William Seal, he bought paper for some of his publications from it. Early in 1712, the old printing house just east of the Sheldonian in Oxford was pulled down and a new one was erected. Hearn took this as a sign of the vanity of the times. While the new printing house was being built, the printers returned to the Sheldonian. On 28th of October 1713, they moved into the new building, which was to be called Typographeum Clarendonianum, or as we know it, the Clarendon Building. The printers actually began work on the 2nd of November, where the first sheet to be wrought off, a favourite term of Hearn's, was signature 3Z in his edition of Leland's Collectinaire. The new printing premises were a very damp, cold place, Hearn reported, and the printers working there soon became ill, and one died, confirming his prejudice against it. Hearn made regular visits to supervise work in the printing house, and during the short time in 1715 that he acted as archetypographus. 
The two men to whom he was closest at the press were Rance and then Brookland, both referred to by him as my compositor. During his troubles with the university over his publications, Rance stood by Hearn, and their relations were sociable. Hearn went to dinner at Rance's house in Hollywell Street and recorded being at night in company with him, once with his two pressmen, Leon Leonard Litchfield and Thomas Wood. Rance and other workers at the press showed him odd bits of printing and binding, as well as old coins and medals that they had come across. Hearn needed Rance and was jealous of attempts to lure him away, telling Thomas Rawlinson in June 1717, I must always keep my compositor at work, for if I once let him go, I shall hardly have him again, the heads of houses being ready to employ him on purpose that I may not have him. He discussed setting up a press with Rance, but reckoned it would cost him at the least £200. His relations with Joseph Brookland, 15 years or so younger than Rance, were not as cordial, though he recorded that the compositor showed him a Roman coin and was a good bell ringer. Bell ringing became one of Hearn's rather obsessive interests later in life. The familiarity with printers and their dark arts meant that he was quite at home with discussing their trade, using the correct terms of their mystery. Hearn knew enough to lay a bet with a compositor about bringing or getting his work in on a page of Leland's Collectanea, and to forget to tell Thomas Rawlinson to have a specimen leaf, leaf of Newborough scabbarded in a proof set by the London printer William Bowyer. There are very few proofs of Hearn's publications, but what survives shows the care he took with them. Now, his real interest in printing is shown by his lengthy commentary on Philip Ga Philip's Gall's engraving of an early 16th century printing office. Hearn pasted his copy into one of his notes, notebooks and wrote 25 pages describing everything he could see in the print that related to how books are produced and of the history of printing, paper and bookbinding. Hearn was at his most typographically adventurous in one of his earlier works, a 1715 edition of the Laudian manuscript of the Acts of the Apostles. Twelve years later, he was still thinking about reproducing manuscripts in capitals, exactly letter for letter. The paleographical plates in the Acta Apostolorum are signed by Michael Burgers, M.B., Hearn's chief engraver, sometimes his friend, and quite often his enemy. Burgers worked on and off for Hearn for many years, starting with the engraving of Dr. Woodward Shield that first appeared in Hearn's 1708 edition of Livy, and again in Dodwell's dissertation on it, edited and published by Hearn in 1713. For Hearn's 1709 edition of Sir John Spellman's biography of King Alfred, Burgers provided the portrait of Alfred to which Arthur Charlotte, the master of University College, so much objected, ostensibly because it was copied from a Bodleian manuscript without his permission. Burgers only laughs at this, Hearn said. The order never to copy from Bodleian manuscripts again certainly did not stop him from engraving the pen and ink drawings that accompanied Thomas Neal's Latin poems presented to Queen Elizabeth when she visited Oxford in 1566. Hearn printed these in 1713. Although Burgers was particularly good at reproducing manuscripts for Hearn, his masterpiece was his engraving of the tessellated Roman pavement at Stonesfield in Oxfordshire. Come to that later. Burgers engraved buildings and coins for Hearn and portraits, like Sir Thomas More's, taken from an engraving in a manuscript of Roper's Life. When he was planning the edition of Camden's Annales and thought of commissioning Burgers for the frontispiece, Hearn told Thomas Rawlinson, I would have it done in my chamber for fear it should be made public by the engraver. Burgers did exactly that. Sorry, Burgers did that for Roper in my own chamber, and by that means no copies could be dispersed. But what came from me? 
But Burgers now refuses to do anything in my own chamber, but says he must have it at home. Presumably the doing he was thinking of was Burgers making a duplicate copper engraving, not of the printing process itself. Following the lead of Mabillon and Montfaucon, Hearn included engravings in his books as documentary and visual evidence for what he was writing about. He paid for most of the plates himself, but occasionally his friends sponsored them, and their generosity was duly acknowledged. The best engraver to illustrate his books was George Virtue, who also produced a fine engraving of Hearn, but it was with burghers that he was most involved. In January 1721, after a sociable meeting in the St. Edmund Hall buttery just below his rooms with Burgers, then nearly 70, Hearn asked to see the five prints his young friend, James West, had just bought for a shilling each from the engraver. They turned out to be from Hearn's books and included a portrait of Thomas Wyatt that Burgers engraved for Leyland's itinerary after Holbein's woodcut image. Hearn was furious with this roguish behavior. For Burgers claimed that the prints he sold were worked off before the plates were delivered to me and I had paid for them, pretending that all plates he does for others are his own till he is paid for them and they are delivered up and that till, each, till such time he hath a right of printing what he thinks fit. In other words, they were bootleg copies. Although Hearn called this such a villainous pretense as needs no words to set it out, they made up their quarrel a few days later. Engraving was not very well rewarded. Hearn paid Burgers five shillings for the title page engraving in Leland's Collectinea, so that one can see why he might have printed off a few more copies of a plate for his own use. Indeed, Hearn himself advertised in the Daily Current that separate engravings of the Stonesfield pavement for sale at sixpence a copy to those that pleased to take off a dozen or more, but to others not under ninepence a copy. Hearn called these engravings that he sold through his bookbinder William Seal in Oxford supernumerary copies. He generally refused to print such supernumerary copies of his books, but in 1712 he broke this rule by having printed two sets of off-prints from volume 8 of Leyland's itinerary. No more than one dozen copies of Woodward's letter to Sir Christopher Wren about the Bishopsgate antiquities were stitched up in marble paper and sent to the author. A separate issue of an unknown number of copies of a discourse concerning the Stunsfield tessellated pavement was also produced. Before Berger's death in 1727, Hearn had, begun, Hearn had begun to use a former bookseller, Benjamin Cole, as his preferred engraver. Cole was a coin and seal collector, a publisher of maps and plans. He was also a non-juror. Hearn called him a poor, pitiful pretender to engraving, a bookbinder who had bound a great many books for Anthony Wood and followed engraving, surveying, collecting coins, etc. But he is master in just nothing. <laughs> the best examples of Cole's works are rather romantic pla plates of Sanford House in Berkshire, a place Hearn became very interested in and walked out to on several occasions in 1722 to 3. The typo, if you can just, you can, might just be able to see it. He missed out a D and put, uh, inserted a D in the right-hand plate with a carrot, um, which is sort of not quite how it should be done. Um, uh, Hearn clearly had a publication about Sanford House uh, in mind and commissioned three plates from Cole, but no book ever appeared. There's a huge amount more to be said about Hearn's books, their typography, printing and decoration, his use of woodcut and engraved head and tail pieces, as well as initial capitals. In three chronicles from the mid-1720s and 1730s, for example, he used initials from a 17th century alphabet of small Blurman initials known as Dutch bloomers which add a note of rustic gaiety to these rather austere works. For the bindings of his publications, 
Hearn used William Seal until Roper's Life of Moore was published in 1716. After that, all of them were issued stitched, with a few bound specially for patrons and friends. First by Seal, and after his death in 1719, by Henry Jones of St. Peter in the East. He, in turn, was succeeded by Andrew Hanley. In the third volume of the itinerary, Seal was said to take subscriptions for the collector near, near the Angel Inn in Oxford. The inn was on the site of what's now the examination schools. Binding the nine volumes of the itinerary might have been manageable since they were issued over a period of two or three years in an edition of 120 copies. The task of getting 156 or so copies of the six-volume collectionaire bound to be issued in complete sets would have been formidable. Seal's business must have been a large one. The results of this edition binding can probably be seen in these two copies of Leland's itinerary in different locations, but in similar bindings. Hearn's success as a publisher brought him money. The enmity of Pope and Curl, enough material there for another set of lectures, and for someone so private, a public presence beyond the petty Donish jealousies of Oxford. As early as May 1721, an advertisement in the Daily Journal announced a fixed price sale in which two of Hearn's editions appeared among the Octavos. This is in 1721. Six years later, in similar advertisements in the press, Stephen Fletcher offered both sets of Hearn's Leland with most of his other pieces. Thomas Freeman was selling most of Mr Hearn's pieces large paper. A sale by Charles Fleetwood in 1731 boasted of a large collection of pieces by that famous antiquarian Thomas Hearn in large paper, curiously bound. There were by then, collectors of Hearn's works who wanted the large paper copies in specially commissioned fine bindings. In fact, the process of assembling what one perpetual subscriber called my Hernian collection had begun by the start of the 1720s. Dr. Pierce Dodd of All Souls told Hearn that because he could not get a complete set of his publications, he was giving up making a collection of them. Hearn received lists of publications that his friends lacked and recorded that Thomas Ward wrote that he had so great a desire for a complete set of all my works. When Thomas Hinton died in 1730, Edward Acton told Hearn he had bought his valuable collection of books published by you. And by the end of the decade, Hearn began to wonder whether it would now be possible to put together a complete set of his publications. Their uniform appearance caused its own problems. In 1726, Samuel Gale complained to Hearn that he had been sent a large paper copy of Langtoft, which breaks my set, all the rest being small. Conversely, some subscribers only wanted large paper copies. Hearn encouraged these collectors, not just by limiting the number of copies he printed, but seeing his productions as a set of works as a whole. When Harley was visiting Oxford in the summer of 1720, Hearn recorded that my Lord Oxford, when he was here, said he, ha he and some others were for having me published a distinct account by itself of my works, containing all the particulars in each volume. In fact, Hearn had been publishing lists of his works in various forms since volume six of Leland's Collect in 1715. His numbering of this list by parts as well as whole volumes produced a total of 40 works. The list was discursive in the sense that it added comments on and supplementary material to his publications. It was dropped until Camden's Annales in 1717, when it reappeared at the very end of Volume 3. There it included Camden, which, is, which if the list had provided numbers, would have been his 22nd publication. All publications had lists after Camden, but the wealth of new material in almost every one of them reached its fullest, fullest extent in John of Glastonbury in 1726, which included nearly 50 pages, 
mostly devoted new, to new letters for the Liquiae Bodleianae. The Liber Nigger Skakari of 1728 had over 20 pages of new material, including the first printed reference to the book of Sir Thomas More that I talked about last week. Hearn's last publication, Roger of Howden, listed 42 works, headed Operum Nostrorum Hactanus Impressorum Catalogus, and included material supplementary to Richard de Morin's, followed by several pages of new letters relating to Charles I's escape from Oxford. Hearn's body of work had literally become a corpus in which the different parts related to each other. To comprehend the full extent of his researches, owners had to have a complete set of his works. He was now a scholarly name whose endorsement was sought after, as here with a preliminary leaf that is part of Anthony Parkinson's Collectionaire Anglo Minoritica of 1726. In newspaper advertisements, Parkinson boasted that his work had been commended by the ingenious Mr. Hearn, indefatigable antiquary of Oxford. Two further indications of this status were posthumous publications, gathering together some of the illustrations to his works. Both were anonymous. The first was a folio volume of engravings published in 1737 called Ectipa Varia ad Historiam Britannicam Illustrandum, providing 52 or so plates. Copies differ. The Ectipa was probably put together by James West, as inscriptions in various copies of the folio suggest. And the histories of some of the engravings can be reconstructed by surviving proofs among Hearn's papers. Among the Ectipa's plates are some of the smaller ones of coins, inscriptions and manuscripts, and also larger ones, such as the Roman pavement at Stonesfield, Dr. Woodward's shield, beer blocks, illustrations of Oxford colleges, and so on. Some of the plates in the Ectipa, such as the one of King Edward the Confessor's chapel at Islip, engraved by burghers from the plate owned by James West, had never appeared in Hearn's publications. The Ectipa became famous in its own right, appearing in the Oxford Almanac for 1747. Yes, you can make it up. Seventy years later, either the plates or the sheets were still available in the mid-1820s when they were republished by John Taylor. At some date after the Ectipa appeared, a more modest four-page half-sheet headed a set of wooden characters of blocks made use of by the late learned antiquary Thomas Hearn, AM, was printed from original wood blocks used in his books. Most of the woodcuts can be traced in Hearn's publications between 1710 and 1722. And quite remarkably, some of the blocks themselves survive, survive in the Rawlinson collection. The likelihood is that these uh, came from Rawlinson, who may well have commissioned the leaflet as a memorial to his friend. After Hearn's death in 1735, a handful of his publications were reprinted. James Fletcher at Oxford, for example, published Leland's itinerary in 1768-9 and 1770-1. William and John Richardson published the Collectinaire, two-volume enlarged edition of a collection of curious discourses, and so on. The first attempt to provide a fresh catalogue of Hearn's works was made in the year 1722 by William Hudsford, although it was based on Hearn's own catalogue. Hudsford counted 68 works. To this catalogue, he added the first printing of Hearn's autobiographical account of his own life and some stray pieces of historical writing illustrated with further engravings that had not previously been published. A more ambitious plan for reprinting Hearn's complete works was published uh, was, sorry, was launched by Samuel Baxter in 1809. 
He proposed to start with the chronicles of Robert of Gloucester and Peter Langtoft, printing 250 ordinary paper and 100 large paper copies of each for subscribers, with 50 more for the general public. The scheme got no further than these two works, but it inspired a more elaborate account of Hearn's works. This was a catalogue raisonné provided by Thomas Frognall Dibdin in the British Bibliographer in 1810 and 1812. In 60 pages, Dibdin managed to describe in detail the contents of just 11 of Hearn's editions. Bibliography, Dibdin concluded, is a severe study. <laughs> in due time, it may become a popular one. <laughs> in the Library Companion of 1812, uh, 1824, Dibdin listed 28 historical works forming the core of Hearn's work, tracking their prices in auction and booksellers' catalogues, and adding the comment, the old and the young professedly attached to book collecting can never be thoroughly happy if their Hernian series be not complete. <laughs> Fifteen years earlier, in 1809, Dibdin had published an 800-page account of the disease of bibliomania, then particularly rampant and about to reach its apotheosis at the Roxburgh sale in the following year with the founding of the eponymous club on its E. Hearn is a constant presence in the book, occasionally appearing as Tom Hearn, as if he and Dibdin were old chums. Hearn is described as bibliomaniacal, and this illustrious bibliomaniac. Although as long ago as 1753, the disease had been recorded by Chambers' Dictionary as an extravagant passion for books to a degree of madness or a desire of accumulating them beyond all reason and necessity, Dibdin was not to know, but would no doubt have been pleased to learn that the OED's earliest citation for bibliomania is Hearn's collection, collections in an entry for the 9th of November 1734, quoting from a letter sent to him by William Broom about one of the sales of Thomas Rawlinson's manuscripts. Had I been in place at the auction, I should have been tempted to have laid out a pretty deal of money without thinking myself at all touched with bibliomania. This would, no doubt, have pleased Hearn too. He had, after all, lived a life, several lives, with books. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> There's no getting out of it. Thank you so much, Henry. That was uh, fascinating and uh, it was a, a, a privilege to hear for you to share your, your deep knowledge with us but, and your scholarship. But also, I really enjoyed your enjoyment. I loved your enjoyment of, of your subject. So thank you again. Henry has very kindly agreed to take some questions, and I think we have time for two or three. So do raise your hand if there's anything you'd like to ask him, and um, someone will come round with a microphone. Uh, we've got someone over there in the blue, blue shirt there. Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. You, you didn't mention uh, Hearn's uh, history. As in, if you were a bibliomaniac now, do you obtain a full set of his work? I, I, I think you're, I, I mean, it's, I'm doing my best <laughs> with, the, with, with the, the help of um, learned book dealers. Um, I think you would find it difficult. On the scale of one to ten? <laughs> very, very difficult, very, very difficult. Uh, I think you would never get all of them. Um, Presumably they were institutionalised, institutionalised but um, yes. in commerce... They, they don't turn up as often as one would like them to turn up. And then quite often they go for quite rather good prices. Um, and um, I, I, I think you would find it difficult to get them in good condition. And strangely enough, quite a lot of them were heavily used. And in fact, quite a lot were, uh, are, are 
quite a lot are in libraries on the open shelves as the only editions available, including some of the chronicles which used to be, I'm, I haven't been able to check recently, used, <laughs> used to be on the, in the round reading room of the British Museum Library um, when it was still there. Um, Hearn's, Hearn's texts were the only ones available wow. in print. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, we have, Brian, we have another one from Brian. Um, this is an utterly trivial question, Henry. Um, with the, having done too much proof correcting, I kept noticing that the spelling of theatre yes. uh, varied between E-R and R-E at differing times, but for no particular reason. Is there any particular discussion of that ever anywhere? Uh, there may be. I haven't come across <laughs> it. Okay. Hearn, Hearn affected his own spelling um, ah. and always spelt Bodleian with a J, um, not an I. Okay. Um, <laughs> as one, as one, <laughs> as one does. <laughs> what he'd have made of the British Library, goodness knows. <laughs> Two J's. <laughs> and do we have a final question? Oh, over there, no. Thank you. Sorry, I missed half of your uh, lecture. Um, the tippings on the inside front cover, were they? Uh, were they the precursors of Ex Libris? Uh, can't think what you're, quite what you're referring to. What, well, uh, but, 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 people get labels printed put yes. inside their books. Yes, but, uh, but, but, but well, book, book plates go back much uh, far, yes, far before. So, so they were the precursor of Ex Libri. Well, well, they, they same uh, idea. Ex Libri's book plates existed in the in the in the fifteenth and sixteenth century. Were they? Oh, yes, thank centuries. You. So that they're not the precursors. My naivety. Yes. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, shall we join in in uh, thanking thank Henry again? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Henry, for your time and for, for taking those, those questions. And finally, I'd like to invite um, the Chief Executive of the British Library, Sir Rowley Keating, to um, make some closing remarks. Oh, thank you, Liz. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, it's my brief but delightful duty to just move a little, a few votes of thanks, actually. First of all, to say this lecture series, what an annual delight it is to be able to host this at the British Library. It could not be closer to the things we love and care about in the vaults under our feet, in the reading rooms and the collections here, and the scholarship and study that we celebrate and enable. And so I first of all just want to thank everyone who has kept this tradition alive, and may there be 40 years and many more 40 years after that of different aspects of the extraordinary history of the book. Second, I would just like to, especially for those of you still tuning in uh, online, thank once again uh, our sponsors, Jonathan A. Hill and Sokol Books, for enabling these lectures not just to be taking place on site here, but right across the country and across uh, the internet. I'd like to say a little note of thanks to uh, my colleague Peter Toth, who's been involved in organising uh, tonight's lecture, whose last week at the British Library this is, and he's going to take up a wonderful new job at the Bodleian, where I'm sure he's going to have a happier time, perhaps, than uh, uh, William Hearn. So, um, uh, but thank you, Peter, for everything you've, you've done. Um, Thomas Hearn, sorry, I don't know why I said William. Um, finally, though, uh, my true duty is to move a vote of thanks to our guest speaker this year. Henry, you have truly brought Thomas Hearn to life for us. What I think we've all sensed is this is scholarship at its most humane, because through your passion for studying these papers, these archives, journeying into that detail, that history, you've gone through the page to find the human being, that great contradictory personality we've been learning about and hearing about, thinking about him not just as a fallible, maybe difficult, but passionate person, a canny business person. I feel I've learned a lot about the book trade, the economics of publishing, design, um, the presentation of books and the community of scholars and passionate collectors that he fostered. 
And um, I feel we've learnt about an individual, the ingenious Mr. Hearn, this illustrious bibliomaniac, and how wonderful to have traced bibliomania back to its roots. I think we're, we're going to cherish that uh, discovery here. Um, and I think finally you reminded us um, of uh, the message. I'm going to get this slightly wrong. But uh, both old and book, uh, old and young lovers of the history of the book can, I think you said, can never be thoroughly happy if their Hernian series be not complete. Well, now, after three Panizzi lectures, I think our little Hernian series is complete. We are thoroughly happy. So please, thank you so much, Henry, for that. Um, uh, just to say, next year, um, because we already have, of course, selected our lecturer for next year, um, we'll be delighted to welcome uh, Elizabeth McHenry, Professor of English at New York University. Uh, and as some of you may know, she is the author of Forgotten Readers, Recovering the Lost History of African American Literary Societies. So once again, the lecture series exploring the history of the book um, in all its diversity and complexity, and we will look forward to that. Um, finally, simply to say, those of you who are able to stay with us, we have a little reception next door. I do hope you're able to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.